Good morning, church. Great to see you. Just in case you haven't realized, we're having a swimming gala this morning. So we're going to do some laps, some relays, and different things. We're having a baptism. Is anyone else excited? I am so excited. I've just realized, I've just told uh, Beth's family that they're in the splash zone, so they've moved. So if you're in this bit here, you might get splashed. I'm just pre-warning you, okay? So the front row is more of a splash zone. Uh, we are so excited. We have six people getting baptized. So it, we've, we've gone through it. We are here to celebrate. Um, I don't know where my co-host is. There we go. <laughs> We're so excited. Has everyone got their coffee in already? I, I didn't know I'd to be here from the get-go. Oh. I'm here now. Literally, I set you upstairs, Christy. I said, right, just come up when I go up. But you're too busy talking. <laughs> Sorry, are you excited, yeah, Christy? I'm so excited. Okay, that's brilliant. <laughs> we are excited for this morning. Um, so as I said, there are six people. It's going to look like this. A quick run through. We're going to go through, uh, obviously, we're welcoming. If you are visiting uh, and you are visiting with the candidates or you are here for the first time and you're wondering why you've got a pool here, we welcome you. We're so happy you're here at Holy Trinity Church here in Weston. We absolutely love baptisms, and you're going to hear some great, great testimonies. In a moment, Chris is going to go through what is and what isn't baptism, what we believe, uh, and just so everyone's clear on that. Uh, and then we're going to have just a time of worship uh, and, go, and, and just spend time worshiping our God, who we're here, uh, just going to do that. Um, if you have any questions and you're visiting, please ask someone what's going on. If, you, if there's a person you come with, ask them what's going on, because it's always good to ask questions, isn't it? If they're really, really hard ones, ask Christy. And I'll okay. ask God. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we're going to invite each candidate up, and they're going to share their testimony of, of why they're getting baptized. Now, I can't tell you their testimony because it's not mine. It's theirs. And I just want you to know that each one is individual and powerful in their own right. Okay? And then, and then we get on to the good stuff. Then we get on to the baptisms. Do you want to explain what the baptisms look like? Yes. Yes. What do they look okay, like in the pool, so, Christy? <laughs> don't you just sprung it on me. I, a, I've had that's called a curveball. And it's not even, okay. So, yes, um, Ruben and Joey are going to get in first because the stairs are floating. Um, so they'll steady the stairs. And then um, our people getting baptized, they'll go in. And Hilton is going to read them a promise. And then, yeah, we're going to baptize them, which means they go under fully, fully immersed. Don't look at me and tell me. I know. Oh, sorry. You're telling them. Yeah, but yeah. that's what it looks like. So they're going to go under. Um, we have charged each, each candidate 20 pounds. If they don't pay up, then we wait until the bubbles stop. Um, yeah. It, it was 100 for you, Chris. So there we go. No, but it's, it was full immersion, so they would go under. So I'm just going to hand over to Christine. She's going to explain what is baptism. Yes, good morning. It's great to be here this morning. It's great to see new faces as well, family and friends of people getting baptized. You're so welcome. Um, so first, I just want to say what baptism isn't, just so we're all on the same page. So you might have been to, in the past, things like christenings, um, where babies or young children are like sprinkled with water, but that's not what you're going to see here today. Everyone here today being baptized has made this decision for themselves. So what do we mean when we talk about baptism? Simply, baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. And baptism proclaims the gospel. It proclaims the good news of Jesus because when someone is baptized, as we've said before, they're fully immersed in the water. And that symbolizes here Jesus going to the, to the grave to die in and being buried. But then when we are raised out of the water, it symbolizes Jesus rising again. Now, there's nothing special about this water. It's just from the tap, but it's just symbolizing our new life with Christ. It says in Romans 6, verse 4, that we've been buried with him in baptism into death. And now we're dead to the power of sin and being raised up out of the water expresses our new life and our union with Jesus. So you're going to hear later on from everyone being baptized their personal reasons as to why they've been baptized um, and why they made this decision. But there is a common thread through everyone getting baptized this morning. And that is that everyone who's decided to make this decision has made a choice to follow Jesus and put him first in their lives. They understand what Jesus has done for them and they want to show everyone here that their old life is gone and their new life 
is here through Jesus. Yeah, amen. Thank you, Christy. So now you understand, uh, you get a little idea of what baptism is and what it isn't. Uh, go through there. So thank you, Christy, for doing that. I'm going to invite the worship team up, and we're going to spend a bit of time in worship now. Um, it's so good. Um, in all seriousness, it's so good just to be here this morning, and it's a privilege to be part of the journey with so many people who are getting baptized and to hear their story of why and that common thread, it's Jesus. So as they just come up, um, I'm just going to ask Christy if she can pray and just bless this time together. Yes, thank you, Jesus, for today. Thank you for this service of baptism, Lord. We thank you for every person who's made this choice today to be baptized, Father. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would give them an excitement this morning as they show everyone here today their love for you, Father. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would protect them, that you would guide them, that you would lead them further into your ways, Father. It's such a celebration this morning that we can come alongside these people, our family, our church family, and celebrate this decision with them, Lord Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would have your hand upon this whole day. We ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would come right now, Lord, and would fill this room, Father, fill our lives, fill our hearts, Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, as we come and worship you this morning, that we wouldn't hold anything, Lord. We would lay it all at your feet, Father, so that we can freely worship you today. We ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. we stand together. Over all the earth. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky, of my one request. Not my only aim is that you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me. every thought over every thought over every word my life reflect the beauty of my Lord cause you mean more to me than any other so won't you reign in me again Lord reign in me reign in God over all my dreams and my time Over all the earth, over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky, but my one request, not my own. Every thought, over every thought, over every word, may my life reflect the beauty of my Lord, cause you mean more to me than any So won't you? 
Failing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you. Wow, what a great song just to, uh, just to move us into the next part of this uh, baptism service. And just some great words we sang there, the truth of why we're here. And if you are visiting, and again, I've said a great welcome, but the reason why we come and do this is because of Jesus. And he gave his life for us. And it's that wonderful thing that, that we have a fresh start, a new beginning. And that is open to everyone. And you will hear in a moment testimonies of people that have been set free by Jesus. And let me say, the fun is only just starting. Amen? Amen. Please do take your seats. Fantastic. Let's give these guys just a round of applause for leading us so well. So in a moment, we're going to invite uh, each, each baptismal candidate up. And they're going to share their story with you of, of why they're doing what they're doing. It's not because it's a Sunday and it's bath day. Does ever, anyone remember Sunday bath days? Yeah, it's not that, okay? Um, but as I said, we sang that song and it's about Jesus. So each person I'm going to invite up, and I want you to give them an encouraging round of applause and a cheer. So first, we're going to invite Anna up. If you can join me, Anna, that would be great. Hi. Are you ready? No one ever is, but it's going to be fine. So it's all over to you. No pressure. Breathe. They're beautiful people. Hi. <laughs> um, I have actually did write a speech, but I don't know how much of it I'm going to be able to read to you. So I apologize if I go a bit weird. Um, so earlier this year... Neil came to our small group and we were talking and we decided, uh, we started discussing our stories of how we had met God, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Um, and Neil pointed out that it would be very good practice for this moment right now. Um, and it got me thinking, so I started telling my story and I realised that it's actually kind of special, for me at least. Um, so when I was about eight years old, we were invited to a lunchtime thing in school because in primary school they used to do that kind of thing um, and it was the mums of a couple of girls in my class that I wasn't a particular fan of but um, I thought I'd go along and I remember one of the mums saying if you want to accept Jesus just ask him and pray and that night I did and I, I think I possibly prayed before but I don't think I knew what I was doing so I said the most childlike prayer you will ever encounter in your life, which was, Dear God, please accept me into your family. From Anna, amen. And, <laughs> and he did. And that's when I met him. Um, I was overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit. Um, I was filled with love. And nearly 30 years later, I still swear that my heart was filled with the brightest light you can imagine. I, I can't describe it in any other way and I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about um, I met God in that moment but I didn't accept him I didn't join him I didn't follow him I didn't give myself to him since then like I said in the 30 years or so since um, I've dipped in and out of all sorts of faiths. I've called myself all sorts of things, declared myself a part of many different faith systems. Toby, get your hand out of the pool. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, 
And, um, but I've always come back to God and fallen away again and come back and fallen away. And then two and a half-ish years ago, I started talking to this lady who had a son in my son's nursery class. And she had this daughter that was in a wheelchair and had the most beautiful smile that you can, hello, <laughs> that you can imagine. Um, and in that moment, I met God again. She was so confident to talk about her faith and God and her church. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to pop along. I'm going to see whether I fit. So basically, it's Rachel's fault, so you can blame her. Um, so I was telling my wonderful small group about this, and you're all here, ladies, and I love you very much. And the lyrics of one of the worship songs that we sing came to mind, which is, is one of the lyrics is, um, he's running after me. And I realized that God keeps kicking up stumbling blocks in my way, just little nudges reminding me that he's here and that he wants me to join him. And it just is such an overwhelming thing. The thought to, he's running after me. He's running after you and he's running after me. And that's just pretty awesome. Um, so before me and the stumbling blocks that are Rachel, David, Ellie, Raw, Obi, and Isaiah, because you are all big stumbling blocks, um, I was in a bad place. Um, I was recovering from a breakdown, which had led me to try and take myself away from my family. I'd been in hospital, being treated for mental health problems. I still am. It's an ongoing fight. It's a daily battle. Um, and I'd been struggling with the fact that I had achieved the two things that I'd told myself I ever wanted to do in life, and that was to become a mum and to become a wife. Not in that order. <laughs> Other way around. Switch that, reverse it. Um, and I didn't think I could do either. I had achieved my only two goals in life, and I thought I was failing at both of them. Um, but through Jesus, I, I was one of the lucky mums that got help. I got taken into hospital. Rowan with me. Rowan, please don't unplug the pool. Daddy, would you like to come and grab your sons, please? Uh, Rowan, Ro Rowan, no, no. Hey, oi, ah, get off. I am so sorry. Hashtag mum life. Um, anyway, so I was one of the lucky ones that got treatment, um, and I started seeking salvation. That's when I came here to this wonderful gathering. I don't want to call it a church because people assume a church is a building. I didn't need a building. I needed a lot of people that worship Christ and could help me worship Christ. And that's what I found with you guys. Um, the moment that I realized this was the 50th anniversary, which was outstanding. The Romford takeover. It was such an incredible event. Um, Incidentally, if you want to watch it, you can see it online. The reason that I know that is <laughs> there was a moment towards the end of it, and it was at one hour, 20 minutes, and nine seconds, if you want to check on YouTube. The pastor that was um, up and singing from Romford, um, one of the songs that he sang, part of it goes, there's no peace within when fear has gripped my soul. My world is shaken. My life just doesn't seem whole. I lift my hands to him. Jehovah Shalom is his name. He's the Lord, my peace. I will not be afraid. I realized I no longer wanted to actively leave this world. <laughs> I had more to see and more to do and more to give. And in that moment, I cried and I ran to a beautiful woman. <laughs> I ran to Dawn. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. And I said to her, Dawn, I don't want to die anymore. And she gave me the biggest hug. And we went over to Star. And me, Dawn, and Star stood in the aisle like a three nutters and danced with the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for that moment. I thank God for Dawn, who I know is up there laughing at me right now. And... I thank God for her sisters. I love you both so much. Um, after a lifetime of stumbling, I can finally say wholeheartedly, 
Today, I commit to be a follower of Christ, and although I know I will not be perfect, I will do my best to be a good disciple and bring the good news to those around me. Thank you, Holy Trinity, for your love of Rich, Toby, Rowan, and myself, and for helping me do this. Amen. Wow. Speaks for itself. And I'm sure that afterwards, if you wanted to speak to Anna, please do. Let's, uh, let's give Chris a big round of applause as he comes up. In case anyone doesn't know Chris, he's very quiet and doesn't say a lot. I'm not praying, I'm just thinking of Marion and Steve and Rachel and Dave's Sunday dinners. They're fabulous, by the way. Anyway, to everybody here today, and those who are unable to be present, and obviously we know who they are, um, thank you for your support today, and I'm sure it's a word that Jesus said very often, shalom, shalom. I'm Chris and I'm a child of God and I affirm my allegiance to the Christian church and my love, faith and gratitude to God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. I praise and acknowledge Christ as my Lord and Saviour, my rabbi, dearest friend and brother. I give you my life as you gave me yours upon that cross. All that I have and am is yours and this is an honour in honour of all that you have done for me. Without your suffering, I would be nothing. And God knows the awful truth of my failings, and it's necessary to share that, this short testimony with you now. I am a chronic alcoholic in recovery, and this is an addiction that slowly advanced and would eventually take over and control my life. It would destroy two marriages both lovely people, leading to inevitable divorce. To my first wife and two of my three children, I am estranged. This includes five children, my grandchildren, who I never see. They live in Western Supermare. My youngest son, I enjoy contact and loving, loving contact with him. And his son, which is good, which he shares with his girlfriend. A lovely boy, and they're both bringing him up well. My second wife remarried and remained friendly. She died before she would retire, which was two years ago, and was devastating to me. The relationship with my youngest son gave me a, a crumb of comfort that I wasn't a complete failure. For failure it is. Alcoholism leaves a trail of pain and hurt and destruction. In the words of Freddie Mercury in his song, I had it all and I lost it. And I deserve and I want no pity. And I am truly sorry to God and those that I have loved, I have caused such suffering. And I pray that one day they will, may forgive me, that they may forgive me. And the pain of wrongdoing caused me years of awful darkness, depression and misery and madness that I couldn't even describe. Period, some long of sobriety, attempting with some counselling and AA meetings to rid myself of this awful obsession. Learning to live alone after being surrounded by a family took me so long, and boy, did I want to give up. Crushing loneliness, and then binge drinking to blot out my very existence. A failed attempt to take my own life. Self-loathing, zero self-worth. I deserved to suffer, but somehow I wasn't going to give up. I was looking for a light in the awful darkness. And somehow, through it all, I attempted to keep strong, mostly through hours and hours of swimming. A wonderful antidote to depression. 
And our wonderful God never wastes an opportunity. And he saw something in me that deserved another chance. Maybe a purpose for what life I have left. I started attending church again and actually was the drummer in the worship group at Milton Baptist Church. Drumming, singing in rock and roll and blues bands was a hobby that kept me interested in life. And I had attended church on and off as a child and beyond. I was confirmed with my first wife in the Anglican Church in 1971 prior to our marriage in 1972. But truthfully, my my faith was a shallow one. I didn't pray often or even own a Bible. I was still drinking in between periods of sobriety. Maybe I was recovering slowly but felt no joy. To be honest, I felt beaten up, beaten up by life itself. And I remember two to three years ago persisting in looking for a full recovery from this wretched addiction. I functioned rather than lived and I prayed that I would never, I actually said, laid, sat down and then I, before God and I said to him, I'm never going to move forward because I don't believe that you love me. I want to, but I, don't, I just don't believe you love me. And I t- couldn't move on and I saw it as an insoluble problem. But I did tell him that I wouldn't give up and I would keep praying. And two days later, while just dozing in a chair, I received a message, and I can remember it now. Behind my eyelids, along with the sound of my phone pinging, I read the message, and I promise you I can see it now. God loves you, with a big X, the cross by the side of it. And my phone was next to me, and so I reached out for it. And I remember jumping. I actually jumped when the phone pinged. And so I reached out for it wondering who the sender was. And I did know a lady who did prophecy, and I thought it could be May because she does prophecy, and occasionally she would send me a little message of encouragement. But, of course, I hadn't had the realization that I'd seen the message, so why was I reaching for my phone? And I did, and there was no message there. And on its own, this could be a nice little story, but what accompanied it was truly amazing. I felt a lifetime of stress and worry, and fear, and misery fall away. A real feeling of excitement and joy. I had tears in my eyes of joys and a lightness of spirit. And that lasted for several days, and it still remains with me now. And I knew the origin of that message, and I don't care whether anybody believes it or not. I know where that message came from. And I have felt the comfort of Christ's presence ever since. It was like casting off the shackles of Marley's ghost, of all that chain that I'd felt that I'd knitted together, day myself, year by year, making it longer and longer, and it had gone. The spirit of Christ lives within me now. I have no desire to drink, but I'm never complacent. Alcoholics are always alcoholics. We are in recovery. So I never get complacent. But I include daily, and I made it a positive thing. I include daily my fast without alcohol in my morning prayers. So I actually fast every day. I'm one of the perhaps a few people who can say that. But in evening prayers, I give thanks for a wonderful day of sobriety. So it's always there at the front of my mind. And I am so, so, so grateful. I can't tell you. And this is my covenant with God daily to fast without alcohol. It is a promise I made to God in eternal thanks and gratitude for all that he has done for me. I will not break that promise to God. I can't. God gave me Romans 12 to guide me. And I know very little about the Bible. I'm learning more and enjoying it. But he actually gave me Romans 12. And I pray this wonderful chapter daily. I've made it a prayer. I give my life to the Spirit of Christ here on earth. My life as a living and holy sacrifice that is acceptable and truly the way to worship him for all that he has done for me. 
every blessing and gift. I die to myself each day to know him better. Following the words of the St. Francis prayer, by self-forgetting one finds meant so much to me. It guards me. It's like armor against the self-pity that I used to have of life's many injustices, mostly petty. I don't clamor for approval or popularity anymore or get hurt by the minor things in life. They wash over me. I give them to God. I don't drink on them like I used to. And I pray daily that he will transform me into a new person by changing the way that I think. We each have the mind of Christ. May I find the way to release that power to become a disciple, an encourager, a healer and a spiritual warrior to fight evil wherever it raises its ugly spectre. May I shine the Spirit's light and be a blessing to my church. And what Anna said was true. It's more than a church. It's lots of friends and love and blessings. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. I can't thank you all enough. And I'm not mentoring individual names. All of you make this place special. And I am grateful. This church of Holy Trinity and... May I be those blessings to beyond the walls for we disciple when we walk through that door. And listen, if I'm a bit exuberant sometimes, a bit over the top, cut me some slack. Trust me, this Chris is light years away from the other one. So just go with me. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm always going to help you if I can. That's my role in life. I try to be kind and I try to do the best. That's all I can do, but I do it with God's help now. So may God's blessings remain with us. And my fellow baptismal participants, I give you my congratulations and my love and my lifetime support. And I finish with this very short prayer and pray that you'll join me. O oh, Jesus, blessed Lord, to thee, my heartfelt thanks forever be. Who hast lovingly bestowed on me thy body and thy blood? Break forth my soul for joy and say, what wealth is come to me today? My Saviour dwells within me now. How blessed am I. How great art thou. Amen, amen. Shalom, shalom. Wow. Thank you, Chris. Each testimony is so vastly different, but one common thread, what Jesus has done. Um, I would invite Faye up, um, but she is going to do a video one, not live, because that would be weird. Um, but she's, re she's pre-recorded a video one, so let's just give her a round of applause and encouragement now, and then we'll play the video. so excited and nervous at the same time but I feel truly blessed to be here and I cannot wait to share my testimony with you and I do hope that my story may inspire somebody today so here it goes. So there has been many times throughout my life that I have struggled with my mental health. The trauma of losing my mum at a very young age has played a big part in that. I was always trying to find a way out of the pain that I was in but I was always determined to better my future. Over the years, the ups and downs continued, but then I became a mum myself, and my son Harvey gave me a purpose and always kept me going. The moment I decided to give my life to God, I said goodbye to my old life and my old ways. When God got to work, he chose a friend at the, to guide me at the beginning of my journey. The help from my friend and the power of the Holy Spirit kept me moving forward, and I trusted the Lord to take control. I knew I was forgiven for my mistakes and I felt free from my burdens. I forgave myself and finally found peace. I was excited and positive for my new life in Christ. I'd never expected in just one year that I would be living out some of my dreams through the power of prayer and God's love for me. For once I felt deserving of the blessings he had put before me and that he truly knew what was best for me. 
So I left my job after 14 years in the NHS to go and chase my dream as a painter and decorator. With a young child to support, a mortgage to pay and being a single parent, you would have thought I would have been terrified. But I wasn't. I had no fear because I knew that this was God's plan for me. I trusted he would look after me no matter what. And what can I say? It has been a massive success. He knew it would, and I have never felt more confident of where I'm meant to be today. But he didn't want me to do this life journey on earth completely alone. He knew my heart and he knew what was missing. He sent me my soulmate, my life partner, somebody to grow in faith with and be by my side. Jesus has opened my eyes to many things and I've never seen life more clearer. He's molded me into the person I am today. He's gave me a new identity. He taught me to love myself again and to always trust that he will never let me down. I am getting baptised today because Jesus saved my life and the love and praise I have for him will always remain in my heart. Thank you for listening. Wow. Fantastic. Painter and decorator. Crazy. 20% off for HT members. Uh, uh, I'm just kidding. Wow. Great. It's fantastic just hearing these. Um, uh, Maria. Let's give Maria a great round of applause. She comes up. Exciting, exciting. <laughs> right. Um, my name is Maria and this is my testimony. When my beautiful soulmate Simon died three years ago, I was devastated and heartbroken and so shattered. We ran the guest house together in Devon. How was I going to live without him? I told my niece Dawn and her husband John, that I wanted to sell the guest house and they were so good. They came over all the way from Birmingham to give the guest house a makeover and they worked so hard and I thank you both so much for doing that. Um, and thank you for being there for me. You were my guardian angels and I, was, I just didn't know what to do and they just came and you really helped me so much and I thank you. Um, But, but when they went home, I was alone and I was drinking heavily. Then we had the COVID lockdown. I couldn't eat, so I just drank uh, and drank. I was drinking bottles of vodka and wine. I lost over three stone in weight. I kept having these panic attacks. Um, I carried a lot of guilt. I, I, when Simon was ill, I wasn't always patient with him. And I didn't realise how poorly he was. And I used to lose my temper with him a bit, you know. And used to, so I was carrying all that guilt on my shoulders. Um, my friends deserted me. They couldn't deal with me. I was a drunken mess, all alone in deep grief and brokenness. I just wanted to die. I had nothing to live for. <sighs> One night I was so drunk... I ran down to the beach sobbing. My neighbour saw me and followed me. I didn't know he'd followed me. Anyway, I was sitting on, the, by, the, sitting on by the edge of the beach and I told him I just wanted to drown. I was so drunk. Um, I felt so stupid because he managed to talk me out of it. Um, but I was still this drunken mess. Oh, I just... Didn't want to leave anymore. I couldn't do it without Simon. He was the he was the one who I should have died, not Simon, because he was the one who he carried me. I was nothing without him. So weeks later, I was drunk and I, I didn't know what I was doing. I was flicking through channels on TV when I came across TBN. I know it's a bit controversial, but I'm sure God led me to this channel. I found this dusty old Bible. I didn't know where to start, but someone on TBM was doing a program on Matthew. It was really interesting, so that's what I started reading. I was getting to know and love Jesus, and that he died to save a sinner like me. Wow. 
One day I sat in my bedroom and I confessed all my sins and it took all day because there's that many. I repented and I asked Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and Saviour. I prayed and I told Jesus all my worries and fears and I felt this comfort of his presence. He carried all my sorrows and wiped away my tears and I felt this peace in my heart. Somehow, I started to get my appetite back and I cut down on my drinking. Then I went to Mary Madeline Church in Torquay and there I became a volunteer serving food and drinks to the poor, sick and needy. And then also, I also became a part of a bereavement group helping people like myself. One day as I was praying, I heard God telling me to move. I don't know why, because I thought I was settled. I was going to move to Malvern, but God put Western Super Mare in my thoughts. And I thought, oh yeah, I used to come to Western years ago with Simon. I told Dawn and John, and yet again, they helped and supported me, and I thank you so much. When I moved to Western, I was so lost and alone. And then I met two lovely ladies, Mary and Sandra, who were handing out tracts in the high street. They are both Christians and they name my dear friends. I then joined the Salvation Army, where I am now a volunteer at their food bank. The team have also become my friends. In August last year, I decided to come to Holy Trinity. And when I arrived, I received this lovely, warm and friendly welcome. I was, I was like blown away. And I've made a lot of new friends in this lovely place. And now I now feel part of the Holy Trinity family. And I gave up alcohol completely. And I haven't had a drink for 11 months now. <laughs> and, and I didn't, I haven't even had any counselling. I did it with the help of Jesus. He, and he's brought me out of this dark pit. And I've got a light at the end of my tunnel. And I'm so grateful. And I'll now commit my life to Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Saviour. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. We're a welcoming bunch, and Jesus is a good, good guy. Wow. Uh, Ruben and Mustafa, we're going to invite these guys up, and I'm going to let Ruben just explain a little bit about Mustafa. Um, so I'll hand over to them. So let's give them a, well, not Ruben, let's give Mustafa a round of applause. So Mustafa doesn't speak very good English, so I'm going to speak his testimony on his behalf. It's a real powerful one, so it's a real joy to read this out to everyone. So, being a refugee is very difficult, but when God's plan for you is this, wherever you are in the world, you have peace and hope of the day when God's kingdom will spread throughout Iran. Jesus Christ was also a refugee, and I am now happy that in this refugee because of the plan that God has for me. Amen. Greetings, I'm Mustafa Mordecai. I'm from Iran and I was born and raised in a Muslim family. And my parents were very religious and fanatic. Since I was very young, I was very curious to worship God. And I knew that in the religion I was in, I tried very hard to know God and the ceremonies I had to do, from praying and fasting to many other things. I tried to do them very correctly and precisely in order to get closer to God. I felt very lonely, and I was very depressed. I wanted something to come into my life and fill my loneliness and take away my depression, but considering all the things I was doing, none of them filled my emptiness. I used to think that if God, I, I used to think that if I felt God was by my side now, with all this, I would think that God had moved away from me, and that's why I put all these things aside and faced many hardships. And in those hardships, I often doubted that there might be a God at all. It doesn't exist. And in this creation of my own mind, 
uh, that I think there is a God. So I was heading towards atheism. During this time, which I remember as the worst and the darkest days of my youth, I was a walking dead because I had lost my job, and my family and I had nothing left to lose. I couldn't even marry my girlfriend. I was suffering from the worst mental and emotional conditions. In April 2022, I saw an old friend in the city. After eight or nine years, he had uh, migrated to another city because of his father's job. He used to be infected with drugs, and he was very evil. But now he had become a handsome and unique person. And he had started a family, and this made our friendship start again, even more intimate than before, and our visits started little by little. I was talking to him about my problems and the events that happened. So my friend considered all these events to be normal, because he considered Islam to be the culprit. He said, as long as there is Islam, these events are normal. Because of my enthusiasm, his friends invited me to a meeting where three of his friends were present. I read myself, and then one of them prayed. The part of the prayer that impressed me the most was praying for my friends and my enemies alike. In Islam, they often take money for people and pray for the destruction of their enemies. So how do Christians pray for their enemies? I thought and asked him for more guidance, and he spoke beautifully. His guidance impressed me. One day I asked him. He said that God introduced to us in the Quran, he is not the, the God of the Quran is not the real God. And the real God is full of love and affection. And the real God has forgiven all of our sins. I saw the real God in Christianity. And I was shocked and couldn't believe it. Because in my mind, I don't think that the God of Christianity was any different from the God of Islam. But he took me, um, he told me that he became a Christian. And I was eager for more information. And the day I became more enthusiastic and calmer, day by day, talking to him. He gave me pamphlets about the Bible because of my enthusiasm, and I constantly received these pamphlets and the Bible from him for about two months. Then he saw my passion and the existence of a home church. We used to go to the home church on Sundays, and one of the people there named Musad was leading the church. I could feel the presence of a true, kind God until the fifth session where Musad recited the prayer of repentance. I was born again and in eternal peace. And when I arrived, I went home, church, home to the home church for nine more sessions. And every week, I changed my phone number um, while observing security issues. Until one day, on my way to church, I noticed the arrest of my two friends. And from there, I turned my way and went to the house of my acquaintance. And after spending two days in the house, I called my friends. And I sent him to get the information from Mr. Musad about the children. But unfortunately, they had also arrested Mossad's brother and threatened Mossad to introduce himself. By torturing the two of them, they forced to reveal our name. After five days of that incident, my uncle called my friend, whose house I was at. He told me what happened, and I told him the whole story. But unfortunately, my uncle didn't believe me and said that he made a case for you. And the sentence is death, and I have been threatened because my brother was a justice employee, and because my case was in the hands of his colleagues who had family relationships, and he knew me. He disclosed all the details of the case to my brother, but I know whatever was in that fire was very bad and made my brother so worried and disturbed. My friend who was in the house loved me very much, and we were good together, and he knew that I was bankrupt and he didn't have any money to hide myself for the few months or few years. Then he talked to my brother and I would pay for his immigration and I'd find someone to take me out of Iran. It took three days for him to get all the money. In the morning, he came home from work and told me to get ready to leave because the, the last night of the intelligence went to the house and brutally damaged all the furniture. It seems they were looking for something like books, pamphlets, CDs, and other things they threatened to tell where Mustafa is. That evening, my friend and I got into the car and went to another city, which is about uh, three and a half hours away from us. And the next day, he talked to the smuggler on the phone, and I went to Tehran and left Iran. But I had a strange feeling. I had the Bible book that my friend gave me as a gift to me. I felt the presence of God by my side, and I knew he would not leave me. 
On the way to my migration, we were stuck in the sea with an inflatable boat with almost 40 passengers. That day, the sea became very stormy, and everyone was crying and reading their own death testimony. When the waves would hit and break, we would all drown. The waves of the sea of the boat would fill the water, fill it with water, and we had a little broken bottle. That was the boat's gas tank. We used to empty the boat. It was very difficult and a very terrible day. It was beyond our ability to steer the boat. But I do not forget God. And I knew that I have found the real God, and he does not forget me, and he saves me. I already seen the movie of Jesus Christ and how he saved his friends from the storm in the sea. And I prayed that God, just as you saved your friend from that stormy day, save us too. And that was the end, because I had faith and I believed in my God, Jesus. Wow. Wow. Isn't it amazing? Stories and, uh, and things that go on that you, you couldn't even believe would happen to you. Um, but that is such a really strong testimony. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, where, let's, where's Beth? Let's invite Beth up. Let's give her a round of applause. She comes. Are you good? Yeah, it's the right answer. Well done. Hi. Um, in the early stages of my life, I was bullied and criticized for my faith. It got to a point where I would get scared to tell people I'm a Christian in fear of their reaction. I thought things would get better once I moved house and school, but I guess in a sense, it only got worse. I stopped praying and reading my Bible and I developed a stage of anxiety and panic attacks. Lost and confused and sad, I asked God for guidance and came to the conclusion that I have to be baptized. This baptism is me asking for forgiveness and leaving my old life of sin and worry and anxiety behind. No longer will I be that shy, intimidated girl, too scared to even speak of her own faith. Instead, I will emerge sinless, confident, and proud to be a Christian because God has forgiven me. Amen. Wow. Some fas fantastic testimonies, stories, and... Uh, and, and I just want to encourage you that if you ever want to ask a question of these guys and just speak to them in more depth, I'm sure they would love to speak to you um, and just tell you how Jesus has just transformed their lives. So now we're going to go on to the fun stuff. So I'm going to invite Christy up and uh, she's just going to uh, lead this next part. Uh, and I'm going to invite Joey and Reuben to test the water. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, we're going to begin our baptisms now and we're going to go in the order that we were in for the testimonies so I would like you to give a massive round of applause and welcome Anna <laughs> and I'm just going to invite Hilton up just now Hilton has um, prepared promises for everyone getting baptized so I'll hand over to you now thank you Anna, your promise is found in Isaiah 43, verse 1 to 4, and I'm reading from the message translation. Don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you are over your head, I'll be there with you. When you are in rough waters, you will not go down. When you are between a rock and a hard place, 
it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, your personal God. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. Amazing. Chris, should we welcome Chris as he comes to be baptized? Chris, your promise is found in Proverbs chapter 4, 20 to 22, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation. Res listen carefully, my dear child, to everything that I teach you, and pay attention to all that I have to say. Fill your thoughts with my words until they penetrate deep into your spirit. Then you will unwrap my words. They will impart true life and radiant health into, you, into the very core of your being. Your hands are going to be sore after this morning. Let's welcome Faye. Thank you. <laughs> Faye, your promise is found in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 to 7, and I'm um, reading from the New Living Translation. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mine as you live in Christ Jesus. Well done, Faith. Mustafa. Where's Mustafa? Oh, oh, sorry. Maria. Sorry, Mustafa. <laughs> Maria, thank you. Give Maria a round of applause, please. Thank you.
Maria. Your promise is found in Proverbs chapter 2, 7 till 11, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the path of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. You will understand what is right, just and fair, and find the right way to go. For wisdom will enter your heart, and knowledge will fill you with joy. Wise choices will watch over you. Understanding will keep you safe. Good. Now, Mustafa, sorry. <laughs> Let's welcome Mustafa to come and get baptized. Thank you. Mustafa, your promise is found in Isaiah 41 and verse 10, and I'm reading from God's word translation. Don't be afraid, because I am with you. Don't be intimidated, I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will support you with my victorious right hand. And last, but by no means least, let's welcome Beth. Beth, your promise is found in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5 to 6, and I'm reading from the Message Translation. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen to God's voice in everything that you do. Exciting. I'm going to ask you just to give these guys another huge round of applause. It's such an amazing thing they've done. Cool. Pastor Steve, over to you. Thank you. Wow. Look at you all. So great to see you all here today. Now you're thinking, how long is he going to be? I'm going to be here. I've asked my wife five minutes and give me the... So I've got five minutes, I've got five minutes, so I'm going to sit down because we've been hearing lots of stories and um, it's always great to hear a story. And I wanted to share a little bit of a story about uh, a painting. You'll see little images of him round, if you can't see him behind me, you'll see probably a little painting that's on the wall or somewhere near to you at this moment in time. As we've been reflecting about changed lives. Why are you here today? We think that we've come to support, but you know, sometimes there's a wider and there's a bigger kind of reason why we do the things that we do. You're not here by chance today. 
And uh, I wanted to draw your attention to a little story, or certainly a little painting, written by a man called William Holman Hunt. And it's called The Light of the World. You see him. He's going to be there all behind me when I just kind of talk from this moment on. If you, if you can't see him, you, you want to see the details, you can look at the, at the picture that's near to you. And uh, this is a picture that has changed many people's lives uh, over the centuries. It really has. Because when we see this particular painting, we immediately know whether we are Christians or not that our own story is contained within it. If you take time to look at the painting, William Hunt presents us with a figure of Jesus. This is Jesus. And he's preparing to knock on a overgrown and long unopened door. And it's the door of our hearts and it's the door of our minds. Or at least I believe it to be that. And you notice if you take a, a bit more attention to looking at the actual picture that there is no handle. There's no handle on the outside where Jesus has stood. Therefore, it can only be opened from within, inside. What does that mean? It means we are free to keep the door of our heart locked and unopened, leaving the divine guest on the doorstep or we can choose if we want to to allow him to enter into our life it's a very simple and powerful analogy really Jesus approaches the door and he waits he doesn't force himself he doesn't make himself push the door open he waits patiently we can tell that he's not going to beat the door down he doesn't show any anger. He's just waiting. You see, Jesus this morning doesn't impose himself upon you. We as a church will not be imposing anyone or anything upon you. He doesn't do anything against the individual will. It's a really remarkable painting. Jesus approaches and he waits at the door patiently. On the contrary, He's knocking, and it's a gentle knock. You can hardly hear it. He's just tapping. And it's an invitation that he's making. He's not making a big song and dance. He's just waiting patiently, standing behind the door of your heart, and he's just knocking. You can hear it faintly. It's reminiscent of a scripture in Revelation 3.20 that simply says, Here I am. I stand at the door of your heart, and I knock. If anyone, and that's a beautiful word, anyone, if anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I will come in and eat with that person, dine with that person, show that person things that they have never seen before, and they will dine with me. I wonder, can you hear that faint knocking today? No, you've come to a service. You've, you've come to support. You're here by chance. I don't think so. There's a knocking. Whilst he comes in gentleness, Jesus is still an imposing figure in this particular picture. There's no doubt who's in charge. We see that he wears two crowns. You see them if you look closely. The crown of glory that is the bright halo. But he also wears a crown of thorns at the same time. He's the king of kings. And yet at the same time, he's the suffering servant who comes to take away your sin and my sin. It is my debt he pays, and it will be my death that he dies. Jesus may not gently but he also knocks persistently. Some of you have heard that knocking before. Some of you maybe are hearing it for the first time, but Jesus has always been standing there. We can't help but notice the sorrowful expression on Jesus' face. Why? Why so sad? Well, how long will he have to keep knocking? How long will he wait? Weeks? Months? Years? 
He will stand the test of time and he will always be persistent. Is he knocking in vain today? Making the painting a night scene also is not by chance. William Hunt is using the lamp of Christ to show that he is the light in our darkness. How many tales and stories have we heard of people who were in darkness? In despair. Oh, you say they're weak people. No, we are all there. That's why Jesus is the light of the world. But more than that, he is the light for you, where you are. And the lamp's rays fall gently upon where? The door. It's, it's on the door, which is your heart, and it's your mind, it's your soul that he's shining the light upon this morning because he waits for us. He's patient. He's persistent. And that same light that you can see that lights up the darkness will be the same light that can light up your life today. In fact, the psalmist says, your word, and Jesus is the living word, is a lamp to my feet. In other words, he can show you the way. Coming into land, the painting is waiting for something to happen. It's in anticipation. It says, what's going to happen next? Because he's waiting, and he's knocking on the door, and the artist is saying, what are you going to do? So what happens next in this scene is totally dependent on the individual door that is here today of your own heart. You see, it's a story that can unfold or it's a story that can remain a persistent knocking. He knocks on the door. He's not going away. And he's here today. And the question, I suppose is will you open the door? And as we have heard in some of these stunning testimonies today of those who have been baptized, outrageous, fantastic, awesome, brilliant, each individual has accepted the invitation, the knocking on the door. They've invited Jesus into their lives. He's no longer standing on the Outside, he's in. And boy, the difference that he can make when he comes in. So this morning, as I land, I invite you, unashamedly. Why? Because I am one who's opened the door. I have seen the goodness and the grace and the mercy of God in ways that I could never really speak about in a short time. I invite you to open the door. I invite you to ask Christ to come into your life. Why wouldn't I? I ask you to change the course of your life today by choosing to follow the course of Christ. Why? Because he knows the plan that he has for you. Plans to prosper you, to give you a hope and a future. Do you have that now? Or are you trying to make it up for yourself? Are you looking to try and find that purpose yourself? That's why Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And if you would like to do that this morning, on behalf of those who have been baptized, I would say this. On, the, on behalf of everyone in this church, where does that warmth, where does that welcome come from? It comes from ordinary people who have had an encounter with God. That's it. I invite you to take hold of the key and open the door today. And if you want to do that, I'm going to pray a prayer. Is that five minutes? Just really impressed, aren't you? Don't expect this every Sunday. Okay. <laughs> Although maybe, a, maybe it's a better way to do it. I don't know. But I'm going to invite you. Why? Because this is the front room of our house. This is our home, and we welcome you to this place, but we, we, we're just signposts. We're just saying, look at what he can do for you. Look at what he's already done. What part of him would you not want? 
What part of him would you not be willing to investigate at least? What part of him would you not be willing to ask questions about at the very least? He has changed our lives and he can change yours too. This is the prayer. So maybe where you are and all of us together, we can maybe, if you would like to, close your eyes. And I'm just going to pray this very simple prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I recognize that I have left you outside the door of my life. I know that today that I have sinned and that I need your forgiveness. I need the new life that you bring. This morning I choose because no one can make you. I choose to turn away from what is wrong in my life. I want to follow you from this day forward. Thank you for showing me who you are this morning. Thank you for dying on the cross so that I might be forgiven. Thank you for all that you have done. And I ask that you come into my life today. Come to be my savior. Come to be my Lord. I ask these things in your name. Whilst we're still bowing our heads and we're still pondering those words, if you prayed that prayer of invitation, then many here today have come and gone before you. If you prayed that and said, you know, today I didn't come expecting this. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for this. This service is for you. This is all being put on today. This baptism service is a signpost, signpost for you that you can know him too. And if you're here today, I'm going to ask you to do something bold. I remember doing it myself as a young man. No one else is looking. But just where you are, just raise your hand and say, that's me today because I'd love to pray with you. Is anybody here would like to do that today? This is your day. This is your moment. It's not to embarrass you. It's simply to say, do you know what? I prayed that prayer. And if anybody would like to raise their hand now then, then I'd love to pray with you. I can hardly see anything at all anyway. Thank you. That's lovely. Anybody else? If I don't see it, then please forgive me. I'm going to say thank you in lieu. Then Lord, I thank you. Today is a wonderful day. A great day of celebration and jubilation. And in a moment, we will sing a song of celebration as we just finish our time together. But finish is not what this is about. It's about new beginnings. The new beginning that you want to be in each of our lives today. Thank you, Lord, for testimonies that we've heard. Thank you, Lord, for stories, Lord, that are true because they are lived and they speak of an encounter with you. And thank you, Lord, for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it brings life and vitality. And I pray that, Lord, those who raise their hands in their hearts, but maybe not physically, I pray that even now, Holy Spirit, that you will just continue that work that you have started because people are responding to that very faint knocking. I ask these things in and through the amazing and the stunning name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite the team back and that's great. And if you raised your hand, if you want to know more, then we have some information that we'd love to give you at the end of the service. Come and see me or one of the guys, Christy or Neil or Dawn. And we would just love to give you some information. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. I think we're going to stand because it's a song of celebration that I think we're going to sing right now. Beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. The eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus.
It is indeed a happy day, and you can ask those guys that forever they are changed. I would start singing, but I'll clear the place. We thank you so much for joining us on this amazing day today. And if you put your hand up, if you made a decision, I would really encourage you to come and see Pastor Steve just over here. He's got something he just wants to give you and just chat to you. So if you did that, please go and see Pastor Steve. But apart from that, thank you so much for joining us today. Enjoy the tea and coffee. Adults, get to the biscuits before the kids, because they go. So I'm just going to enjoy you, uh, ask you to do that, and have a great and blessed rest of the day. Amen. Amen. Amen.